Nestled 2,600 feet above sea level in the Blue Ridge Mountains is the mill town of Canton, North Carolina. Watco Company's Blue Ridge Southern Railroad is headquartered here, operating on the remnants of the Murphy branch that was sold by Norfolk Southern in July of 2014. The Murphy branch was once a through route between Asheville and Murphy, connecting with the LNN into Georgia. In the early 80s, newly formed Norfolk Southern Railway decided to mothball the branch west of Silva due to declining freight traffic. This portion is operated today by the Great Smoky Mountains Railroad out of Bryson City, running excursions to Dillsboro and Nantahala. The rails below there to Murphy are still in place, but have fallen into disrepair. Known as the T-Line during the days of the Southern Railway, the route is famous for its undulating profile, including grades in excess of 4% on Balsam Mountain, which are still in use today, rivaling the nearby Saluda grade on the W Line. Today, the northern portion of the W Line is also operated by the Blue Ridge Southern above Hendersonville, with car storage extending to the foot of Saluda grade at East Flat Rock. We're set up on Bridge Street overlooking the yard waiting for signs of activity, putting ourselves directly in the wind, which is fortunately blowing that lovely mill smell away from us. Our goal for today is to chase the T31 East to Asheville, which interchanges traffic with Norfolk Southern in their yard. It's a quiet morning on Martin Luther King Jr. Day in 2020. We're not sure which jobs are running, or if the railroad observes the holiday while many businesses are closed. Blue flags and lights protecting the set of power they normally use indicates that they are being worked on by mechanical personnel, likely meaning these locomotives are not going anywhere anytime soon. After 10 minutes of numbing our fingers, the crew hops on the set of GP39s just after 8 o'clock and moves them forward. Unsure if this is a yard job, we stick around to see what goes on. The mill lies hidden behind the thick plumes of steam rising high on this cold morning, with temps in the low 20s and a chance of snow flurries in the forecast. The Canton Mill is currently operated by Evergreen Packaging, most known for their food and beverage carton products. While the mill has changed hands many times over the years, the name of the founding company is proudly displayed on one of the few buildings remaining from the original campus. The Champion Paper Company was incorporated in 1893 in Hamilton, Ohio, the same year Canton was incorporated after changing its name from Pigeon Ford. Canton is allegedly named after the same town in Ohio which provided the steel for the bridges across the Pigeon River. It wasn't until 1908 that Champion set up shop in the Canton area for the rich chestnut forests along the Pigeon River headwaters, made accessible by the expansion of the Western North Carolina Railroad in the 1880s. By 1894, the railroad was sold at foreclosure to the Southern Railway. At this point, it's still not clear what's going on, but seeing a pair of former Delaware and Hudson GP39-2s operating in 2020 is quite a treat. 20 of these were built new for the DNH in spring of 1976, and Watco currently has five in operation on the blue. With the power moving to the west end of the yard, being the only active crew as far as we could tell prompted us to move to the bridge across the Pigeon River. We made the right call. After swapping out the 3940 for 3932, the crew proceeds west as light engines. Not originally planning on chasing a train this direction, we ended up four miles west at the Main Street crossing in Clyde as the snow flurries picked up.
Three miles and ten minutes later, we had no trouble getting ahead of the power, slowly moving down the railroad approaching Junaluska feed. Check out that sign on the right, an old Southern Railway whistle post. The markings represent the Rule 14L long, long, short, long crossing sequence used since the 1930s, replacing the previous two longs and two shorts that often left the last note ending before passing through the length of the crossing. The undulating track profile is evident as the light engines drift downhill towards Lake Junaluska, where the tracks will briefly turn south toward Waynesville. Emergency apparatus and the crew exchange noise as the locomotives bend into a new section of track built in 2016 to replace the old bridge over Crabtree Road. Just down the road, we set up by the evergreen packaging Waynesville plant north of town in case the crew stops to work here, but they continue down the main as another truckload of paperboard arrives at the plant. In town, we caught up to the power stopped before the Miller Street crossing, where a Vietnam-era Huey helicopter sits on display between the VFW and the tracks. A few minutes later, a tech comes out from Giles Chemical to remove hoses from the tank car in the spur, answering our questions about where and what work this crew would be performing today. The conductor waits patiently, as it takes a few minutes to properly secure the car for movement. I've never actually watched this process unfold, so I didn't mind standing in the cold to get a few angles of the train sitting. After about 10 minutes, the domes and the hatches are tightly secured and the engineer finally pulls up past the switch on the other side of the crossing. This is as far as the crew would go today, so unfortunately no exploring the line over Balsam Gap to Silva, where a few online customers remain including an LPG terminal and occasional cars for the wooden paper industry at TNS Hardwoods and Jackson Paper Manufacturing. Giles specializes in the production of Epsom salts, made from two key ingredients delivered by rail. Both loads in, empties out. I guess the spur isn't tied into the crossing circuit, so the gates don't activate until the locomotives shunt the main. The conductor is just out of view on the left, flagging the crossing from the intersection. What I did not realize up to this point is that there are three crew members today, another waiting down the main, lining the switch toward the tank cars in the siding. The placard on this tank car lets us know it's carrying a Class 8 corrosive substance. 
1830 is the UN number for sulfuric acid with more than 51% acidity. Premier Magnesia LLC, the corporate owner of Giles, operates a mine in Gabs, Nevada, producing magnesium oxide and hydroxide trucked and loaded into covered hoppers in Fallon on the Union Pacific near Reno. The white powdery substance is reacted with diluted sulfuric acid to make magnesium sulfate. Epsom salt is the result of crystallization into heptahydrate magnesium sulfate, also known as Epsomite. The name comes from a spring in Epsom, England that was long believed to have healing qualities. It was later discovered the mineral waters were rich in magnesium sulfate, giving birth to the bath salts we know and use today. You can tell from the lack of spring compression that the first three cars are empty and the fourth is another load to be spotted on the spur. It does not appear the hoppers need a switch today. In the distance, the brakeman restores the derail on the spur while the conductor lines the switch back to the main. I'm guessing the other two tanks on the siding are loads and the current empties will reside there until all have been depleted before heading back to Asheville to swap with more inbounds. They'll tie some brakes on the cars, thus concluding their switching duties here for the day. We relocate back up the road a couple miles to Evergreen Packaging, hoping they'll have work here. I couldn't imagine they'd have a three-person crew on duty just to switch one car. The symbol for this job should be T-59 which retains the numeric portion from the days of the Norfolk Southern P-59 local. NS used the prefix P for Piedmont Division locals, while Watco aligned their letter prefixes for the route, simply using T for the T line and W for the W line. Looks like we're in luck, the brakeman removed the derail and rides ahead to get the switch. For whatever reason, an empty hopper sits by the main instead of in by the plant. We know it's an outbound car since polyethylene pellets are delivered here for the finished products. Paperboard makes up about 80% of the container while low-density PE coatings are applied on both the inner and outer surfaces to create the liquid barrier. Okay. 
We know it's not a grab-and-go, since the conductor waits by the cut lever of an empty boxcar that will be spotted in the plant for loading finished product. It's been exactly two hours since the crew hopped on the power at Canton, making quick work of their day. We figured while they switched out the cars would be a good time as any to warm up and have a lunch nearby at Dickie's Barbecue. We return a half hour later, just in time to witness them spotting the last boxcar indoors. A bit of a traffic jam formed while making this move, including another load of paperboard waiting its turn. We saw several drop frame trailers in and out while waiting, I'm guessing they're used locally between plants. Back out to the main they go, with the first car they grabbed. Several loaded box cars were placed on the main while we were at lunch, so we'll finally get to see these locomotives pull a train. Just up the road at the next crossing, the flurries still obscure the top of the distant, mile-high peaks, starting to let up at ground level as they depart up the hill from the plant switch. Junaluska feed towers over the train in the background as they ascend over the other side of the hill we saw them at in the morning. If you look closely, you'll see the crew having a bit of fun at the sight of our cameras.
At Nile Drive, there's yet another view of the train cresting a hill just outside the Canton Yard limits. Throttle quickly gives way to dynamic brakes for the final descent into town. While Saluda gets all the fame for its 3 mile 5% grade, the Murphy Branch comes with a mountain range of challenges, featuring two steep, long mountain passes and many short steep hills. Imagine, if you will, operating a long train over the length of this territory. T-59 never exceeds more than a few cars, having no problem navigating this terrain daily. They've dropped over 50 feet, not even a half mile since passing the camera, or an average 2% grade down into the yard. Back in town, the crew works the west yard pulling over the Pigeon River to shove into another track. The river is named after the passenger pigeon, whose migratory nature brought large flocks to the rich forests, though rapid deforestation for lumber and agricultural lands eventually led to their extinction in the early 20th century. The confluence of the East and West Fork happens seven miles behind us, with headwaters forming on opposite sides of Tennant Mountain, just above the Blue Ridge Parkway. The river flows 70 miles northwest to Newport, Tennessee, where it empties into the French Broad River to Knoxville. About halfway stands the 180-foot Walters Dam built in 1927, diverting water into a 6.2-mile-long tunnel through the mountains, returning downstream at the Waterville Hydroelectric Station on the Tennessee border. Beyond there, rafting is a popular attraction, bringing tourists and economy to the region, but it wasn't always this way. The pollution from the Canton Mill has been a highly contested debate for decades. In the 80s, the river smelled foul and was filled with foam. Residents of Tennessee started the Dead Pigeon River Council as high rates of illnesses disproportionately affected communities along its banks. As lawsuits mounted, Champion spent over $300 million in upgrades throughout the 90s converting the mill to an elemental chlorine-free bleaching process. Though Champion denied its connection to the illnesses, the improved efficiency enticed them to switch, saving additional costs with oxygen delignification and using hydrogen peroxide and chlorine dioxide as bleaching agents. While the use of chlorine has been dramatically reduced, resulting in cleaner mills and rivers, chloroform remains a byproduct, causing a watchful eye for those downstream the effluent. Back in town, they pull empty wood chip cars from the mill. I'm guessing they're building the outbound train that a future T-31 crew will take back to Asheville. As paper mills across the country have shuttered over recent years, there's no telling when Canton may meet its demise. The original Champion Paper Mill in Hamilton, Ohio, closed its doors in 2012 after 164 years of operation, but the rebranding of the Canton Mill into Evergreen Packaging seems to keep it in stable operation, employing over 1,000 in this area alone. 
Although researchers and activists work on alternatives to the use of plastics in packaging, paperboard will still likely play a huge role keeping the steam whistle echoing across Canton for many years to come. The 12 o'clock whistle sounds, letting us know it's lunchtime. As for the crew on the Blue Ridge Southern, who've had a short four-hour day to this point, it did not appear a run to Asheville was in the cards. We'd stick around for a few minutes to watch them shift before heading east on Interstate 40, which proved to be a good decision. Wood chips for Canton arrive in Asheville from all directions. Evergreen sources most of its rail cars from Royal Blue and Pioneer, Tennessee, from the west via the Knoxville district, while those from the Bridgewater plant on the S line traverse the old Fort Loops from the east on local P87. Other plants in South Carolina, including one at the base of Saluda in Landrum, truck their loads upon closing of the grade. Unfortunately, it is very unlikely Saluda will be reopened just to run a few cars of wood chips and local traffic. The S line east of Asheville sees very little traffic. At the time of filming, 135 and 136 were through freights between Knoxville and Linwood, but have since cut back to Asheville, leaving just the P60 and P87 locals over the famed Southern Loops. Fortunately, after leaving Canton, we got word of P87 departing west from Bridgewater, hurrying down I-40 as far east as we could to intercept the train. I hope you enjoyed this brief tour of the Blue Ridge Southern, and stick around for the next video of P87 taking wood chips over the old Fort Loops, thus concluding our trip in North Carolina. Thanks for watching.